Fabio to give us a talk from Solo to Bronze and Beyond. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I've, I've put a bit of a, a little presentation together. Uh, it's not supposed to be um, highly technical. Uh, the other thing I'll say as well is, as I go through, please unmute, unmute yourself, ask questions. We can take as long as uh, or as little as, as you guys want. Uh, but as, as Andrew said, so the, the talk tonight is how you go from the picture on the left, uh, so how you go from solo to the picture on the right, uh, which was my very last flight before lockdown, um, doing uh, doing some flying on on cloud streets. So before we we start, uh, I kind of want a, a bit of a disclaimer. Um, the the first one is everything that you're going to hear tonight is my own views and my own experience. So don't go after the club or the BGA, and more importantly, the CAA. Uh, they already have my name on file. Uh, so this is. Just my views, no one else's views. Uh, this clearly is aimed at, at early pilots, so sorry for the experienced guys. Uh, the one thing I would say about both points is for the experienced pilots, if I say something that is blankly wrong or blankly against uh, club or the BJ policy, please at any point jump in and interrupt. Um, as I said before, I'm not a professional or an experienced glider pilot. It's just my viewpoint how I've been doing it for the last three years. You guys can take all of it, none of it, some of it. It's entirely up to you. Um, I'm not actually going to talk too much on how you're going to go about getting your bronze and your cross country. I think we've, we've had some really excellent lectures uh, before. Uh, there's some really good advice on the BGA website. I, I can talk in the end a bit how how I did it, but in terms of how the, the, the sort of requirements and so on, uh, I think Derek and, and Paul did a very good job at covering those already. Uh, the one thing I would say is that we all go about things differently. So although I'll, I'll try to talk a little bit about how I went about it, doesn't mean that you need to go about it in the same way. We all approach life differently. We all have different workloads, etc. Um, so there is no right or wrong way of doing it. Um, I'll also take no credit for what happens tonight, either good or bad, don't blame me, uh, you're on your own on this one. Um, and finally, you know, if you sort of seen this after the lecture or if you want to chat a bit more, I'm always available. Now I don't fly anyway, so all I've got to do is talk about flying. So by all means, you know, call me, text me, we can meet at the club. Um, I'm always available for a quick chat. Okay, so let's begin then. So the, the one thing that, you know, the, the day you go solo, it's, it's quite a weird day because you, you sort of fly, you fly an aircraft for, for the first time and I don't think the reality of it sinks in on, on the day. It takes a few days to sort of to figure out what, what has actually happened. And so the, the one thing, if you don't take anything else from this talk, is you are now in control. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing. The, the first thing to realize is when, once you go solo, you are a little bit by yourself in the sense that, you know, it, it's up to you to come up with, with your path. It's one of the things that I probably enjoy less about gliding is, is the sort of feeling that once you go solo, it's, it's a little bit up to you. But at the same time, it gives you quite a bit of freedom to choose what you want to do. And as, as it says there on, on the quote, it's, it's up to you to set up, the, to set the pace, to take the decisions, to figure out what you want to do next. And sometimes that's a bit clearer, sometimes it takes uh, a bit longer. Uh, but the, the other key thing as well is you're now responsible for both yourself and the safety of your peers as well. So never, never forget that. It's something that when on the day you go solo doesn't really strike you, but then the more you fly, the more you realize that that you're now a, a, a almost fully fledged pilot. So what that means is that you get to decide what comes next. Um, some people walk away um, and there's, there's a multitude of reasons. And I know a few guys have come back since I've joined the club, they've come back after very long breaks in their life. And, and they always, it's quite funny because they always feel very sheepish about it and like they've committed this, the sin of walking away from, from gliding. Um, I, I think there's two things there. One, once you realize the what you have to do after you go solo it, it's really hard it's really difficult um and it requires a lot of effort and, and dedication 
Uh, but life just gets in the way, you know, shit happens. Um, some, sometimes you move jobs, you move homes, kids get in the way. And that's not necessarily a bad, a bad thing. So the advice that I have for the guys that are now coming back to gliding is lose that sort of weight and I've done something wrong in my life because, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, some people go solo, but decide actually this whole cross-country malarkey is quite dangerous, um, uh, or I'm not interested in it. I just want to rig my glider, fly within the five nautical miles and land. That's perfectly okay. Uh, some people um, decide to give powers um, a go, and we've got quite a few of the solo guys that, you know, do do both modes or one. Uh, you use gliding to build up the hours to power, etc. Again. That's all perfectly okay. Um, you can do some aerobatics. I've done a little bit with uh, with our CFI. It's really great fun, and it's really it's a really good way to learn some coordination and some discipline with with the controls. Uh, most people obviously uh, tend to go cross country and start collecting badges, and I think for us, particularly in Cyphers, you know, other challenges will be ridge and wave soaring and going on expeditions and, and eventually going to instructing. But again, the, the, the key thing is once, once you go solo, it's up to you to decide what you want to do. And there's, again, there's no right or wrong answer. You have to do and to decide what suits you. And if you have to take a bit of a break, then do it. If you want to get your silver within six months, then that's okay as well. Um, however, if you do decide to, to continue to fly, there is a bit of a mountain to, to climb. Now, I don't know if you, if, anyone has seen but there's a very good documentary about uh, this mountain here so this is El Capitan in um, uh, in the states and there's a guy that soloed uh, the so he climbed all the way from to the top there and he did it solo and quite impressively he did it without any ropes any safety gear or anything I think it's called free free climb or free solo something on on those lines and it's, if you guys, again, if you take nothing else, just watch that documentary. It's like an hour and a half. And there's so many parallels to life after, after going solo that, that is quite impressive. But the, the gist of it is, once you go solo, you sort of think, well, you know, I, I'll go bronze, I'll go silver, get my gold, get a, you know, a, a duodiscus and life is good. And you sort of look at it and you sort of say, well, if I look at the size of those trees and the size of the mountain, that's, a, that's, that's doable until you actually start doing it and you realize that you're this tiny, tiny speck somewhere over there in a very, very tall mountain and there's, there's quite a long way down. Um, so not gonna lie there, once you do go solo, whatever you decide to do, the learning curve is, is quite steep. And if you remember the talk that Mike Fox did uh, three or four weeks ago, um, you, there was a little clip where he listed all the things you have to know once you go solo. Um, and it is quite impressive. And, and no matter what you do, there's, there's an impressive range of skills that you have to learn. Um, and, and you kind of have to accept that, that if, if you want to continue with this, th there is going to be a mountain. The mountain can be higher, can be smaller, but there is, there is going to be a learning curve. So the guy that climbed is called Alex Arnold. And you can, there is a way to go about climbing that post-solo mountain, trying to use some of, some of the tips that you use. So you've got a fit young man on the left-hand side that climbed El Capitan, and you've got someone that doesn't even look good on a picture there on his solo. So, um, but when I was, um, when I was putting this, the slide together, and he, and he talked about this throughout his, um, his documentaries, how, how he actually went about doing it. And you, you sort of get this, this impression that the guy woke up in the morning and decided, hey, I'm going to climb El Capitan four hours later at the top. And actually, he spent almost a decade preparing for that. And it's, it's quite an impressive way that he went about it. So the first thing that, that he did is he didn't sort of just woke up one morning and said, I'm going to do it. Um, you know, he, he sort of thought about what is the next logical step? What is the one challenge I want, I want to do? And again, there's a lot of parallels. When, once you go solo, you kind of, you have to choose what you want to do. Don't necessarily sit there and go, well, everyone goes cross country, so that's the objective. You know, you, you might just want to do some aerobatics. You might, again, want to walk away. The, the first step of the journey is always define what you want to do. Don't, don't necessarily do what others want you to do. 
Um, so the second thing that Alex did was to sort of figure out what, you know, we studied El Capitani, figured out all the different ways he could, he could do it. He eventually settled on this free rider uh, path. And again, once you, once you know what you want to do, think about what kind of steps you have to do to, to get there. So for example, if your goal is, is to get a gold, you know, think about what you will have to do to, to do that, not just by yourself, but also, you know, talk with people that are experienced. We, we're quite lucky in the club that we've got people that have done aerobatics, that have done wave, that have done ridge, that are cross country guys, that are people that just stay local. So whatever, whatever you do, whatever sort of sit there, because at, at this stage, we don't have a lot of experience. We haven't seen enough of the, um, of the gliding world to know whether or not that's a sensible thing. There's no point in you saying, right, I'm solo, and then in six months, I'm going to be G-Dale on a race. It, it's just not going to happen. So whenever you, you come up with, with your path, just talk with someone that understands these things so you can get an idea of whether or not it's, it's a logical thing. Um, so again, once he decided what route he wanted to make, he, he spent, he broke down the route into very small chunks. So he would go a day, he would climb for an hour, get to a certain distance, and he memorized every single bit on that rock to the point that he could almost do it with, with his eyes closed and he knew every nut and cranny on, on the way up. And again, if, you're, if your goal is to do a 300K, don't sort of go, right, I'm going to do a 300K because very quickly you're going to find this barrier that will stop you doing it because you, you you've got this massive goal but you don't necessarily have, have a way to do it so you know think about the steps you left to to do to to get to goal so you know i need to be better at local soaring and then extend that beyond beyond the gliding range i need to do some field landings i need to learn how to read the weather so when you start breaking into those small tasks not only it's easier to feel like you're achieving something, you eventually build enough small tasks that one day you wake up and you go, hey, I've done my 300K. Um, and, and you have to practice. Again, if, if you, you can read all the books in the world, you can come to as many webinars as you can. Gliding is about practice. You have to practice. And again, I've learned this the hard way. Being an engineer, the mind is you read a lot, you do it once, and you're perfect. And when you're not perfect, you then have a massive argument with the instructor on the day as to why he's wrong. And clearly, that's not the way to go. So, you know, you, you kind of need to set a goal and practice. The other thing that I would recommend as well, when you break this down into tasks, make sure that the task that you're doing at that part of the year makes sense. So, for example, a lot of people uh, in the summer, uh, and you see this especially with pre-solo pilots, they go in on a very sunny day, very sorrowful day, and they say, I want to do launch breaks. No, forget it, because it's a day to go soaring. And you'll see instructors saying this over and over again, saying, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go soaring. So again, if you're getting to, to the winter season, for example, and you say, you know what, I want to do my cross-country endorsement, that's very unlikely to happen because you need two soaring flights. But if you say, okay, I want to do my bronze and then maybe my radio license or I want to learn about the weather. So always think about the time of the year you are and whether or not that, that task that you've allocated makes sense, essentially. Um, so after he did all of these, in, you know, in a day, he would start climbing and he would come back. And he would analyze what went well, what went wrong. And again, very it's it's very similar to what we do in in gliding when when you do go about your small chunks you you have to be a bit objective about the progress don't be like me and say everything that i've done today was crap and okay i didn't bend the glider but short of that everything was crap but at the same time don't go to the other extreme and say i was phenomenal you know i was up for five minutes when my average is three so i was phenomenal so always take a bit of an objective view of where you are um, and again, talk about, about it with the CFI or with, with instructors and say, look, I feel that I'm getting stuck on this. Am I going about it the right way? Or, you know, this is not going so well. What else can I do to, to improve? And, and kind of be open and honest with yourself and, and the person you're discussing. Um, don't just, just sit there and think you're either amazing or you're crap because chances are you're somewhere in the middle. But 
again, it goes back to once you're solo, the expectation is you, you kind of get on by yourself. That doesn't mean that the instructors are not there available to help you. And everyone, especially at, at our club, everyone is quite friendly and quite happy to help. Uh, but it is a little bit down to you to sort of say, this is my plan. This is where I think I am. What, what do you think? Don't shy away as well once you go solo to have check flights. I remember when I went solo, it took me a while to come to terms with check flights because I always assumed check flights are a way for instructors to check on me and to prove that I'm unsafe. And actually, nowadays, I, every now and then, I just, even if I'm feeling safe and current and so on, I still fly with an instructor because I want a second opinion because I sort of feel maybe I'm not being objective, assessing my progress. So again, try every now and then to get a second opinion, both on the ground and in the air. Um, and then the, the other thing with, with Outlooks, there's a halfway through the documentary, there's this point where he's sort of high up, way too high up, and he gets frightened. He looks down and he, he sort of, he, he panicked and he stopped, he got really scared, and he just, he just came back. And again, I've learned this the very hard way, be prepared for setbacks things will go wrong at some point. An, an example, you know, you can have a global pandemic that grounds you throughout the summer. That, that is beyond your control. Uh, you can get to a point that, you know, you don't round out as well and you stall the glider. You know, be prepared for those things to happen and think about ways to maximize it. So for example, with during the lockdown, you know, if you can't fly, what can you do to, to go about your plan? If it is reading a bit of books or if it is to get one on one tuition with an instructor at the club, you know, there's there's always ways you might find as well that it, once you decide your path. So let's let's say that you decide to, to become a cross country champion and, you know, you're one year into your training and you say, you know what, I actually quite hate going cross country. I hate the knowledge of field landings and talking with ATC and so on. That That's fine. You, you can come back and say, I've got all these skills and that's great. But this is actually not what I, what I want to do. So you can choose another path. Don't, don't persist on the same path if it's not making you happy. Most of us, uh, or the vast majority of us, do this for fun. And this is a lesson that I've learned with, with Chris Fox. We do this for fun. When it stops being fun, you're doing something wrong. Either you chose the wrong path or you, cho you chose the wrong activity. But the point is, we're doing this for fun. So continue to have fun throughout. Okay, so how do you go about climbing that mountain? So obviously to climb the mountain, you need some tools. So again, I'm not gonna give you very specific tools. This, this is all very generic and take as much as you want from this. But the first one, you have to be current. And there's, there's two types of currency. One is the, the one that the CFI says you're current as per the club procedures. And the other one is you are actually current and capable of controlling an aircraft. Um, you see this quite a lot in the winter. People just refuse to come to the club in the winter. It's too cold, it's too windy, it's too rainy, not enough hours in the day, all sorts of excuses. And actually, during the, wind, uh, during the winter, it's when you've got a better opportunity to have an instructor with you for a longer time because all of the experts are not going to turn up. It's not sorable. So do keep coming to the club. You know, set yourself if you can, if the club is running, don't go more than two weeks without without coming to the club and practice something. You know, um, you, you can you can practice launch failures. You can do a lot of things. The the other thing as well in the winter is when you're likely to have the most challenging conditions. Uh, I remember one of the one of the last flights that I've done with Paul Shelton. We were landing on crosswinds of 50 knots and uh, 15 as in. One five not five zero. Sorry, the CFI is watching this, so I need to be need to pay attention. It's one five not five zero. Um, but it it was a very good lesson because again, it, you know, you are on your toes throughout the whole thing, and and the flight lasted three minutes, but it's really intense flying because you know the conditions are against you, and whatever you do. So uh, the one thing I will say about these tools, whatever you decide to do, aerobatics, cross country, local sorry, it it's the same. If you are flying locally only, and there's a very gusty day, you need to be able to control the aircraft. If you, if you can't control the aircraft, there is a chance that very serious things can happen. So don't just say, oh, well, 
you know, the currency is, is important if you go cross country. No, it's, it's important all the time. Um, the other thing that I've, that I've learned with, with a couple of guys is to have mind models. So we all know on a thermic day, you go underneath the cloud. Okay. So that means we have one mind model about what the thermal should look like. Um, we all know, for example, not on, on blue days, not to go over water because we sort of go, well, water doesn't really react well with the sun. I don't really understand why kind of thing. So if you know how thermals work, how lines of energy work, um, if, if you know how things are supposed to look like, then it's a lot easier for you to then do your next step. And again, it doesn't matter if you're going local soaring or cross country. If you're local soaring on a blue day and you do not know where to go and search for lift, you will land after five minutes. It, and you will, you will make the club very rich because you keep taking launches, but you will come back many, many times. So try to create a, a mind picture of what it looks like. So for example, if you know a firm's coming by, you know, in the morning, you, you always get the instructor saying, you know, a front is coming by later in the day. And you can see who the experienced guys are and the less experienced guys. The experienced guys look at it, know exactly what it is. The inexperienced guys are nodding yes and not having a clue what that means. Because the mind models just aren't there. You just, you haven't learned that. And there's ways of going about it. I personally prefer, you know, reading about the theory and then trying to put that into practice with, with some coaches. Some other people just want to watch loads of videos on YouTube. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of ways to go about it. Whatever way you pick, it has to be suitable to the amount of time you have and, and your learning practices. But again, if you know what it looks like or what it's supposed to look like, you at least increase your chances of, of staying in the air for a bit longer. Um, the, the third one, and this is quite complicated these days, is, is time. Okay, not just time at the airfield, uh, but also time at home. If you, if the only contact you've got with gliding is once a week when you go and fly, that that's fine. But then you, you then spend seven days where you're not really going to look at it. So the more time you can dedicate to gliding as an activity, both on and off field, the quicker that progress is going to be. It doesn't mean that if you can only go on the Saturday for that amount of time that you're not going to succeed it's just going to take you a little bit longer and again it's being aware of that limitation and not necessarily saying oh i don't have time for gliding no you just probably don't have time to progress as quickly as you would imagine and um, a good example here i i always get very frustrated when i see 18 year olds there are you know coaches and instructors and you sort of think come on the guy's 18 how, how does he know how to do all this stuff because realistically he doesn't have a mortgage to pay for or he doesn't have a job to worry about um, so you you kind of have to balance your progress versus your ability to spend time uh, doing your hobby don't expect again to be a gold in the year if you can only spend five percent of your time on this um, I, I found that having a good knowledge of your glider limitations um, and and your equipment and I, I include in within the equipment things like rasp etc gives you a very good advantage and it's similar to the mind models what we tend to do especially flying club machines is we we go solo we fly the twins for a bit we then fly the single seaters but honestly how many people that have gone solo have picked up the flight manual to read about the glider limitations i'm the first one to admit that it took me about six months until i actually thought this might be a good idea um, and the thing is that the the flight the 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 flight manuals for the aircraft give you loads of tips about how your aircraft are supposed to fly. Um, if you don't know what the stall speed is for your aircraft, how the hell do you know how close you are to that level? So if you, if I tell you, you know, soar or when you're soaring or thermally with Hun, you know, do do your thermals at 40 knots, and you sort of go, okay, yeah, that's fine. The guy has more experience than me. That's completely wrong because. Again, it depends on the conditions, it depends on the angle of bank. So once you start to understand your glider limitations, you don't have to spend half your, th your thermaling time thinking, what the hell is the aircraft going to do? You know what the aircraft's going to do, you know about it, you understand it. And you can just think about where's the next thermal, where's the other glider on, on the thermal? 
Um, and again, you don't want to, for example, if you've got um, an in-flight computer, you don't want to be fiddled with it whilst you're flying. That is not the way to go. And the last one, and I, I'm the first one to admit that I'm a big uh, underconfident pilot. You, you do have to have confidence. And again, it needs to come with a little bit of measure here. Um, the, the more confident you are, the more you will progress. And, you know, breaking that barrier to going beyond the, the, the gliding range is a big one. I've done it a couple of times, and the second time I've landed out, sort of 12 miles down the road. So that sets back your confidence a bit because you say, how am I supposed to do a 50K when I've landed out sort of 15K down the road, you know? But the more you sort of say, okay, I'm a safe pilot, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly within my ability and the glider's limits, then you sort of get that confidence to say, okay, I can see loads of thermals, I understand what's going on, I understand how the glider go, is going to fly, I'm gonna give this a go. On the other end of the scale, don't, don't sort of get to a point of saying, nothing can happen to me, or I'm gonna to get to the airfield today without a plan and fly a 50K, because it's just not gonna happen. Either you're gonna hurt yourself, or you're going to annoy everyone every time they have to go and pick you up from a field six miles on the road. Um, and, and there's a way to, to sort of increase, and th there's a way to increase your confidence, and this comes a little bit, it's a bit of an abstract concept, but think about when you graduate to single seaters, you know, when an instructor comes to you and says, I think you're ready to take one of the precious assets from the club by yourself, you know, that, that is a big vote of confidence in you. Um, you know, when you start flying from other sites, and I've, I've covered it in the newsletter a couple of months ago, and you go and fly with a CFI that never saw you, doesn't know where you, what you know, and you do a couple, of, a couple of flights with him and he goes, yeah, you're fine to go solo. That's a big confidence boost. And you kind of need to learn to assess those, those things as a sign of people trust me. The, the flip side to that is there's nothing stopping you from saying, I understand you trust me and you've got confidence in me. But the first person you, you need to have confidence in is in yourself. I, again, I, I've been in a position where people said, I think you're ready, you know, I've done the check flight, I'm happy with it. And I said, I, I feel like I need a second one. Don't be afraid to, to say, I don't think I'm prepared because ultimately when you're flying solo, you are also in, you are in charge of your own safety and the safety of others. If you if there is any doubt, then there is no doubt. You need a bit more time and a bit more support from from the other instructors. Um, I'll make a little bit of an aside here on on the tools. Um, I, I know a lot of you guys have used Condor, and there's been a lot of talk about Condor on the um, on the WhatsApp group. Um, and, and again, this is a very personal view, and I'm happy to be contradicted on this. As, a, as an early pilot, I don't particularly like Condor. Um, and I think the one of the BGA webinars, Jake and, and the other chap touched on this a little bit, and they are much more experienced than me. When, when you're relatively young to, to gliding and relatively fresh, it's very easy to pick up the wrong habits, especially if you're flying by or flying uh, by yourself. The, the first one is, you know, you're looking at the screen, you're not doing any lookout, and you'd be amazed how quickly it is to just fixate on looking ahead when you're going back to the glider. Um, most people don't have rudder pedals, or the rudder pedals and the stick don't necessarily fly in the same way as they fly in a glider. And again, you pick up some very bad habits of chasing the SI, or chasing the string, or chasing both at the same time. Um, the other thing with, with Condor, I don't know what setup you guys have. Unfortunately, I don't have a full motion simulator at home. So when you're going through a thermal, you're relying solely on the Vario. I mean, you sort of look at the picture there and you look at the cloud and you go, well, I'll, I'll probably go to the left there and that's probably okay. But you rely on the Vario to tell you when you're in the thermal. And again, you'd be amazed how quick, how long it takes when you go back to a glider to have that feel. You hear a lot of people talk about, oh, you, you know, you sort of feel the glider go up and you feel the elevator. And for a year, for me, was absolutely, I have no clue what these people are talking about. No idea. And now you start to get that feel because I've, I've stopped Condor altogether. Um, 
trimming I found for example trimming is very hard to get because you don't have any force feedback on the stick so it's very hard to sort of get that feel and if you're flying by yourself and you sort of go oh I've done my 50k to Shodden oh I must be an amazing pilot it, yes but how many wrong decisions have you made along the way so you know I found for example when I've done a couple of flights at the club with someone like Peter Gill. You sort of get feedback and criticism, mostly criticism, on sort of live feed. So if you are going to use Condor, at least try to get someone that is familiar with it uh, to sort of help you through it. You'll see a lot of the more experienced guys using Condor and having amazing flights. Because, you know, think about driving. If you go and, and, do, and do a driving simulator on your laptop, you, you kind of have years and years and years of driving experience behind you. So you kind of know, okay, if I, you know, hit a pedestrian on the game, it doesn't really matter. Uh, clearly, if you do that on the road, quite a lot of paperwork involved. Um, so it's, it's a little bit the same principle. You, you know, there's only so much you can get. Um, I, I do recognize, however, that Condor does have some advantages. Uh, if you've got a, a good laptop, which is not my case, you can get some really detailed scenery. So if you want to see what the scenery looks like on your 50K and get used to it and sort of say, there's a, there's a village there, there's a city there, whatever, it can be quite good for that. But again, Google Earth can do the same thing for you. Um, I tend to use Condor every time I change the menus on my Etsy store. I tend to fly it in Condor uh, just to make sure that it sort of works in the way that I expect it to work and visually it's not a lot of workload because again, I don't want to be figuring that out in the glider. Um, and again, it's, you know, if you look at the, at the cloud on the left, you can sort of start thinking, which side of the cloud am I gonna go? Why am I gonna go to that side? So Condor can be used to help you validate those, those mental models and sort of say, okay, I'm gonna go to this cloud and then I'm gonna go to the next cloud because of X, Y, and Z. That sort of thing, there's a bit more of an advantage to do it with an instructor again because he can talk you through the process, but Condor can be a, a good tool to do that. Um, okay, so uh, another thing that I, I think it's important to talk about and being sort of male-dominated sport, we, we're never afraid, men are never afraid of anything, uh, but the reality is, and I can guarantee you this, uh, you will at some point have some sort of fear. And this could be fear from going beyond gliding range. This could be fear from, you know, let's be honest, hurting yourself quite badly. Uh, it could be fear of looking like a Muppet when you're flying with an instructor. It, it doesn't matter. And, and the reason I want to put this section here is very early on, after I went solo, I, I stopped flying for, for six months. I completely stopped. Um, and because I had, I've, I've scared myself, I got to a point that I had two relatively serious stalls during the round out. And, and that really shook me that I, I sort of said to myself, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, this is supposed to be fun. And here I am having pot chances of who wants to shorten my life kind of thing. Um, to the point that I, I had a second flight with a particular instructor that owns a share in the Janus. And I just walked off. I landed the glider, picked up my bag and walked away. Um, so, I kind of having been through that experience, uh, I think it's it's important to sort of pass the message that fear is going to be present. And there's sort of three laws around fear that I've sort of learned the hard way. The the first one is you are going to scare yourself at some point, either on purpose or because things just go a bit beyond your control. You know, even the simplest thing of you flying happily in a the thermal. And there's an absolute cowboy like me that comes in, starts turning inside you. And the next thing you hear is a clunk in your glider somewhere. Or, you know, you're flying happily along, suddenly the, the cloud covers um, and you have nowhere to land. You, you kind of have to accept that at some point you, you will feel fear. It's, you know, I felt fear in many different occasions. The, one of the times that I flew from Denby quite happily flying in wave 19 and a half thousand feet coming to land and there was an absolute thunderstorm below cloud and Chris still decided it was a good idea to go and do some bridge story. And I've got to say, I've, I've done it, but you know, I did need quite a lot of underwear changing after that. So you will, you will experience fear. And if any pilot tells you they haven't, they are lying. I can guarantee you that. Law number 
two, what we do is dangerous. There is a lot of statistics and you can spin the numbers the way you want. What we do is dangerous. Most of the gliders we fly are 30, 40, 50 years old, maintained by majority on a budget. Um, and, it, you know, the, the whole point, if you think even thermally, if you think about it, when you go and, you know, you can't soar away and you have to land in the field, there's no way to know what is on that field. And if you pick SMG, every, every edition of SMG, there's a wide range of things that happen and, and some of them are dangerous. Um, so you, you kind of have to come to terms that this is a dangerous sport. This, there's an element of danger. Obviously, if you're doing aerobatics, that is slightly more dangerous than potting around in the airfield. But again, even that, if you don't control your speed very well, you are risking, you know, a, a spin at 300 feet. So it is dangerous. One of, one of the things that people tend to quote quite often is it's more dangerous to, to drive to the airfield than it is to fly. Now, yes, if you've got 400, 500, 1,000 hours flying, when you've got two, that clearly isn't the case. You know, you, there is an element of danger because you've only experienced a range of conditions and most of that time was with an instructor in the back that could save the, uh, the situation. How many times have you heard of, you know, anecdotal stories of instructors saying, I was in this really weird condition and the student went, you can never go. And, and, and that's true, you know. So when, when you're flying solo, there's only so many conditions you've experienced in that short life. So it is not safer to drive to the club uh, or, or safer than driving to the club. It will be eventually, but just isn't. Um, and, and the law number three is that bad things can happen to anyone and it doesn't really matter your level of experience. Um, I know, for example, um, Peter Gill uh, on his lecture put the, uh, the video from, uh, from Baleka. Um, when, when you read the accident report from Baleka and you, and you read the circumstances and you sort of think, how could he do this? You know, he was a very experienced pilot. On the day, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how experienced you are. Sometimes the conditions are against you. Sometimes your head is not in the game. Uh. Sometimes you sort of think it will be okay. It's just a local flight. How many times have you heard people saying, I'll be all right, it's just a local flight. Things can happen there as well. And it doesn't, being experienced doesn't protect you. And if you, if you sort of accept those three laws, your position towards fear becomes a little bit different. If you do find yourself a bit scared whilst you're flying, um, the, the one bit of advice, if, if you can't read anything else from this slide, is by all means, don't sort of, you know, the expression man up, just, just don't. You know, don't talk with someone, either another instructor, the CFI, a club member, just you, you kind of have to find a way to manage it because if you scare yourself, it can be very hard to come back. And I was very lucky that I got quite a lot of advice from quite a few people at the club and I'm back flying. If you, the more you keep it in, the, the more chances it is that that's going to become the overwhelming factor in your flying. Um, you know, talk openly with someone you trust, doesn't need to be an instructor. Obviously they are more experienced, but sometimes can be a bit daunting talking with them. You know, face your fears uh, in a controlled way. I'm terrified of ridge flying. I really am. It scares the crap out of me. I don't know how people do it. I hate doing it. And I've done it with a couple of instructors and it can be good fun. Can I do it solo? Probably not because I'll still scare the crap out of myself. Uh, but the more you do with people that can manage you through that fear, and again, even something as basic as flying away from your field. When I flew with my, my Fox, I did three times 50K on the same flight, no problems whatsoever. And you, you suddenly realize, hold on a minute, I, I can do this and I can do it safely. Um, you know, planning is a, is a big part of it. Again, going back to the 50K, Derek has talked quite a lot about this. Don't just rock up on the day because you, you, you're gonna hurt yourself, you know? And even when you're flying, don't sort of go, right, you get to the top of a cloud and then you say, oh, what's next? What do I do next? It's not going to work. Eventually, you will do something stupid. Um, a, a lot of times we, we get to the club and you, 
you're not really feeling on your top game. You know, you, you had a row with someone, you, you hate your job, you hate the people pulling the glider. You know, if, if it doesn't feel right before you get in the cockpit, just, just call it a day. It is really hard. It is incredibly hard, especially now that we haven't flown for quite a few months to just say, you know, I, I don't want to do it. But just, just call it a day. If it happens whilst you're flying, and the, the reason I landed out was because even though I knew exactly where I was and I had an XC sore and a map telling me exactly where I was, I convinced myself that I was lost, which is to this day quite incredible. Um, so if you find yourself whilst in the air in a situation that it just becomes too much, try, try to calm down, keep focused and, and just land as safely as you can. No one is going to have a go at you. No one is going to uh, blame you for anything. The main thing is make yourself safe and then you can analyze it and you can talk about it after the event. Um, the last one, I, I found that it helped me quite a bit, was is just to sort of take a bit of time away from gliding. If, if you go to a gliding club and you say, I'm thinking about quitting, unless you are outright dangerous and a liability to the club, no one's going to tell you that's a brilliant idea. And sometimes you kind of need to get away from from the club to get a different perspective. And I spent the, the six months that I was away, I spent quite a bit of time reading about the differences between power flying and gliding and talking with other people about it. And actually it helped me realize how much I enjoy gliding and, and the challenges to the, the, the challenges associated with gliding that made me interested in it. So sometimes take taking a bit of time out is a good thing. Don't cut yourself from the world because, again, I was quite glad that I talked with a couple of instructors during that time. Uh, but sometimes it helps to get a bit of perspective. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is owning a glider, which, if I'm honest, at the moment, I'm struggling to see the advantages. I know it will come good one day, but at the moment. Um, so when, when you go solo, the first thing you think about is converting to a single seat. And then once you do that, you say, I want to buy my own glider. So when you're flying a club glider, generally, these are the things you need to worry about. First of all, getting there early enough to get home because no one wants to fly a Lehman Tango. Um, you may be asked to do the DI, which you sort of go, you try to see if someone else can do it for you um, and maybe try to get it up and down from the roof. Um, you could read the flight manual. Realistically, no one does it. And I know, again, I know the CFI is going to ground me for the next 10 years, but the reality is very few people actually read the flight manual, uh, which is, again, a very good document. It's not as bad as it sounds. And if you are fussed, you clean the glider at the end of the day, or else you just say that you've got an appointment and you go away. Now, when you own your own glider, you eliminate one key item there, which is you don't have to wait for anyone. You rock up, you do your own thing. However, having said that, there is an impressive list of knowledge that you have to gain. So you have to rig it, you have to DI it, you will clean it endlessly. The amount of time I've spent cleaning a glider that I haven't flown yet, is, it's mind-boggling. You, you have to know your flight manual because if anything else, you know, read the report kind of thing. Um, you will learn about a lot about maintenance. The amount of maintenance these things have is unbelievable. Uh, most gliders come with a trailer as well, which if you're like me, I've never driven a trailer. Uh, I had the car that could not move the trailer. So you suddenly realize there's this whole other object that comes with a glider that I have to take care of as well. You then have to pay for insurance, um, which is very expensive if you have low hours and if you don't have a silver. You also have a parachute in the back that normally you put at the stand at the end of the day if you're flying a club aircraft. But if you have your own, you also do need to do the maintenance of that. And once you have your glider, you suddenly realize that you can't rig it by yourself. So you need other people's help. But to have other people's help, you need to help them as well. So by the time you get to flying, you may have rigged about six or seven different gliders in the morning. So when you do buy a glider, you have to consider that it's, you're not just buying the glider. You're buying this whole other package. It's a bit like marriage. You're not just marrying the wife. You're marrying the entire family, friends, pets, it's the whole thing. It's exactly the same principle. If you do decide to own your own glider, um, again, this, this is a bit of a general advice that I'm learning as I'm going along. 
But the first thing to do is think about if it makes sense at this stage. So if you've got very low hours, um, you know, is it is the right glider? And it's a bit of a trade-off between is good value for money, is the glide is a glider that is actually ideal in the sort of next year or two, and the chances of getting another one aren't there. So for example, that's kind of what happened with my Astia. It was a very good aircraft. You don't see many CS seventy sevens coming on the market, so it was a good bargain. Um, but but also think about how many hours you have to fly in your own glider per year to compensate all the expenses that were on the previous slide. So for something like the Astir, and if you are a single owner, you basically have to do 45 hours flying on your own glider to off to be the same cost that you would have flying a club glider. And that is a lot. That is a lot of hours for someone that has just gone solo. So I know that this year, even without COVID, I probably wouldn't manage that. But I sort of think that next year or the year after, I can probably get to that level and, and the investment compensates a bit. Um, also get some opinions from other club members. Um, what is the right glider? Also, you know, try different gliders before you, you set on one. Um, and the one thing I will say, you will need, when you buy a glider and you are a, a low hour pilot, you will need uh, CFI approval to, to basically fly the glider from, from the site. So if you think about buying a JS3 as your first glider, chances are Paul will probably say no. Um, the other thing you need to, to balance is, is again, what, what is more important? Is it the budget or the glider? So if you've got a, a set budget, so let's say you've got four grand to spend, you're probably looking at either a really bad year or a really nice K6. If you sort of say, actually, I'd rather buy, uh, or spend a little bit more, but actually have a glider for the next four or five years, um, then you probably spend a bit more and you get something like an ASIR or an ASW15 or whatever. Uh, the one thing I will say is whatever budget you think you're going to spend, you're going to spend more than that. You're going to spend at least 25% more. By the time you buy the glider, you find that you need a new instrument or needs a new seat cover or needs a new set of wheels for the trailer. So whatever you, you set, just put some padding on it. Uh, choose your syndicate carefully. Um, friendships can be made or lost um, with, with gliders. So if you've got someone that you think, oh, I really get along with this person, um, you may think again. Um, for example, I like things done in a particular way and I like people to care about the glider as much as I care. So if I fly with someone that doesn't give a crap about the glider, they're not going to be my syndicate partners. Um, so just be mindful that just because you get along with someone in the clubhouse doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get along with them as co-owners. Um, try to go for something that is already at the club for two main reasons. One, it's a lot easier to get advice for it and to get spare parts for it. But at the end of the day, you're going to pick an Astia because that is the best glider to buy. Um, no, you're wrong there, Tiago, but still, carry on. Well, well, I, I know there is a small Lebel Appreciation Society at, at the club, but they will see the light eventually. <laughs> um, the, the other thing as well is don't wait to own one to figure out how it actually works. There is a lot of people that, are, that have their own gliders, so give them a hand in the morning. Start helping out rigging. Start going around the trailers and see how different things work. Because not only gets an appreciation of how much work is involved, but also when it when it does get to your time to own a glider, you don't sit there and go, "How do I rig this? How do what am I supposed to do with this?" Um, when you do, if you do go offsite to buy a glider, uh, do bring someone experienced. I was very very grateful to Mike Webb to come and with me all the way to Tivenham and back to go and see an Astier because it was a tip, the glider was terrible. And on the pictures, it looked amazing. And we got there and there was just, it was hopeless. So don't buy anything by yourself. The reality is you don't have that experience to sort of judge whether a glider is good or not. And there are little things like, you know, the, the weight distribution or the weight range, that is quite important. That tells you a lot about a glider. I didn't know this, but having someone like Mike and Paul Witters advising me was, was a huge advantage there. And 
secondly, um, or, or lastly, what, when, I, when I was going around buying gliders, I thought, oh, you know what, I'll buy a glider, and I don't really care if the trailer is a bit tatty, I just want the glider. Until someone pointed out to me, what are you going to do when you land out? I said, well, I'll just use one of the club trailers, and they said, not a chance. <laughs> you buy your own glider, you have your own trailer. So if the glider is, is a good glider, but the trailer is an absolute tip, you are sort of uh, limiting yourself to local flying because on the back of your mind, there's always a, I don't have a trailer for someone to come and get me. So you're either adding pressure that you don't need when you fly, or you're limiting yourself to local soaring because no one's going to give you a hand. If you don't have a, a decent trailer, no one's going to risk hooking the trailer to the back of the car and go and get you. That's just how it is. So um, I've been talking for quite a bit now and probably bore you all to death. So I just kind of want to summarize a few key points and hopefully you'll remember these sort of four points going forward. Um, you've gone solo. You are now in control. You know, don't wait for uh, an instructor or a CFI to come and tell you, oh, I think you should go and do this. They, they don't know you. You know you. So you, you know what is important to you and what you want to do. To go seek advice but don't wait for that advice to come to you and importantly remember that now you are in charge of your own safety and the safety of, of your fellow airmen yes it is going to be hard there is a mountain of knowledge no matter what you do but there is if you break it down into small tasks and you and you try to apply the tools that the instructors give you and, and the books give you and, and the tutorials give you, you can break that down into manageable chunks. And next thing you know, you've done your silver height, you, your silver duration, your silver leg, and you realize that actually you, you got to that point without even realizing that there's a huge number of little tasks that you've gone along the way. But also learn to appreciate those little victories. Um, you will feel fear. Fear is absolutely normal. Uh, men do feel fear I've been told uh, and don't whatever you do don't hide it don't sort of say oh I've, I've got a man up because that's what is expected of me talk with people fear and aviation is a bit like alcohol and aviation it, it's just it's the recipe for disaster and seek advice not just from uh, from the instructors and from the CFI but also from other pundits you know Everyone is very friendly. Everyone is very approachable. Uh, and unless they've just came back from a very frustrating flight, probably don't approach them for about half an hour. Uh, but, you know, if you're interested in something, you know, if you want to know how to rig an Astea, everyone can give you a, a tour of their own Astea because they don't want to show off that their Astea is better than everyone else's Astea. So everyone is, is quite friendly. Do use that, that body of expertise that we've got in the club to your, to your advantage. And do talk. I've, I've realized that expressing my my views my fears my doubts has actually given me quite a lot of feedback from from the instructors and it has made a big difference in in some points so that's all i had so i'm open to questions i just want to add one thing um i'm at a very similar stage or thereabouts um as you and we kind of progressed parallel to Tiago. Um, my observation was that pre-solo pre was kind of like high school and post-solo is a bit more like university, where pre-solo, you're in a program, you turn up, um, you're assessed at where you are, you do the next exercise, and that's how you, you, that's how you um, move, move forward. Post-solo, like you very well said, um, you have to ask for knowledge. You have to ask for things. So you have to go and ask for certain exercises and, and you know, for, for people to show you things and, and help you progress. Um, and I've, I think once you've soloed, there is that little no man's land where you don't really know how to move um, forward. This isn't a critical comment um, to the club. It's just how it is, how it's constructed. But it's, I think it's important that people who go from that pre-solo moment to the post solo moment that they understand what, what's, well, basically what they need to do to, to move forward. And, and that's the thing. I, I think you've touched on a good point. It's not it's not our club. I think it's gliding in, in general, unless you're in the likes of Lasham or maybe Hasbars, where they're very professional and probably take a little bit away from the hobby and, and the fun. Um, you, you're basically by yourself. 
and and so you suddenly you know after you've gone solo and you've done a few landings you sort of sit there and you go well what's next there isn't okay there is a bit of a plan and you kind of know bronze and silver and so on but maybe that's not what what you want and uh, I, I sort of find that, for example, it, you know, one, one advice I'll give to people is talk with other people that have gone in, in the same situation. And like you said, there's, I think at the club now, there's about five or six of us sort of similar experience and similar age. And, you know, if we all, we tend to talk quite a bit about, oh, what are we going to do next? Or we could do this, we could do that. And it, it's a little bit up, up to us. It doesn't necessarily need to be. Um, but I find that because there's so many different characters in, in the club, it can be a bit difficult for the club to say, right, once you go solo, this is what you're going to do. Because you have some people that just want to fly dual for the rest of their lives, and they're just happy to pass it around. Um, and that's what I sort of tried to do today, which is, it's up to you. But don't just sit there and sort of go, oh, what do I do next? You know, use the expertise from either other instructors or other people at the same level to sort of say, yeah, I, I kind of want to do that. Question from me, Tiago. Um, I'm obviously at the stage with, we're all Andrews, aren't we? Andrew Cowie, Andy Kidd, and myself. Yeah, Andy Club, yeah. With, uh, with Paul doing our bronze studying at the moment, etc. Uh, can you talk us through the practical part of bronze? Obviously, we're doing the, the theory side with lectures with Paul at the moment, etc. We've got the paper to get through the exam. But what about the flying side? What, what do we need to do there, Tiago? So I'll, um, I'll wait for the CFI to correct me if I'm wrong. When I did my, the, the bronze leg, um, you've got a series of, of flights, which as, as usual, I made, I made a big deal of it. I'm, I sort of pretended that it was like this exam to become a, a Concorde pilot or something. And actually all it is, is, is a series of check flights. And normally there'll be somewhere between three and five flights. And they are generally just like a check flight. And you will have, you know, uh, at some point there will be a launch failure. Um, they basically, what they're looking for, and Paul told me this when, when he did mine, they're looking to see if you're a safe pilot, if you are capable of controlling the glide in a safe manner. So if you, if you take your bronze practical exam as a, this is a check flight, you relax a lot more, you, things go a bit easier. In, when I did mine, I did my, on a very cold day. So on my very first flight, the canopy missed it up. So Paul was in the back saying, are you okay to continue the flight? And at this point, you sort of go, I should say no. But you sort of go, you know what? I, I can see out. I, I can see out. And, and the first flight was terrible. I, I ended up launching and then halfway through the circuit, so having to tell Paul, you, you have to take control because I can't see outside anymore. And that's just not the way to go. Um, and that's kind of the, the thing they want to assess is, are you a safe pilot to to fly the aircraft. So take it as a series of check flights. One of them is bound to be a launch failure. Um, assume that all three or all five of them will be launch failures. And if you're, if you're safe to fly, I, I don't think, and again, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's any particular, you know, specific requirement. If you read the guidelines is, can they do a coordinated uh, turns? Can they plan a circuit correctly? Can they deal with emergencies in the right way? You know, can they go through the pre-flight uh, checklist correctly and make sure that they're safe to fly? The navigation and the field selection and landing involves a, a lot more planning, I, I found. The bronze ones, if you take it as a series of check flights, then that's the way to go. Um, Andrew, in, in the uh, briefing room, in the clubhouse, in the uh, filing cabinet, there's a whole series of pa paperwork there uh, on, on the various levels of com competency in check flights and the, the, there's a sheet which is called a uh, bronze general flying skills test and you'll you'll see i can't remember now it's a while since since i had a look at one but there's probably about a dozen items on on that which so if, if you go and look look at that paperwork that, that will give you a good idea of the range of of skills that, that would be being checked for for your bronze and that's that's also a good way when you read the, those skills it's a good way so if you want to plan a series of flights to prepare you for the bronze that that sort of skills tells you the things you're going to be tested so you can always get on on the club on the day and tell the instructor i want to try this particular aspect because i think i'm 
you know, I'm a bit rusty on, on this. So it gives you a good series of things to prepare for, for the actual, uh, for the actual practical. So that's a good point, Derek. That's something I've, I've definitely done was to read what was expected of me and then try to create a sort of a training plan around it to prepare me for the exam. Tiago, it's, it's Andrew. Can I ask you to stop sharing your screen so I, I can see some of the participants? But the other, the other thing is, um, you talked about the flight manual, um, and um, I think that's a great idea. Uh, where, where would I find the flight manual for Horner? For so they're all kept in the uh, in the office, um, so in the in the little office by by the kitchen. Each aircraft has a folder uh, next to it, or with with a registration, and inside the folder there's all the documentation. The good thing about our steers is you can find copies online of the manual. So if you just go CS77 flight manual, you'll find it. The only word of warning with doing that is with flight limitations, so speeds and weights and so on, always double check with the flight manual for the respective aircraft because they, they can be slightly different through incidents or damage or whatever. But to get a first sort of, you know, what sort of stall speed does an Astir do? What's the best glide for an Astir? You can, you can find both for the K13, the twin, and the single Astir, you can find them online. But always double check, especially the flight limitations with the actual aircraft. I, I googled, I googled it, Andrew, and found the the twin, the Grob 103 twin. And it's found it on Google. And, and is it, does it operate like a library? Do you take them out and sign them out, or or, or do you have to stay in the office with them? How, how does it work? I think ideally you would you'd consult them in, in the clubhouse because chances are they will go walk the other way. I, I would say that if you're taking anything away from the club, make sure that people like uh, Paul, uh, Peter Gill, Mike Webb and Peter Lowe know where those manuals are. So at least we've got a last known position for the manual because ultimately that manual belongs to that aircraft. No, absolutely, good. And, and, and you covered my other point, which was about owning a glider. And um, you, you know, you, you talked really honestly about that. And I think at the moment, you know, if you look at the club, there's a nice K6 and a, a, a Labelle, you know, a relatively affordable part of syndicates. And apparently, there's an ASW19 that seems to be quite. Yeah, I've been told about this ASW19. I don't know. It's a new thing coming up. No, I, I don't think there's an ASW19 for sale. I don't think there is. <laughs> no, I, I mean. It, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I, they, I keep hearing about this mystical ASW19. I still haven't seen anything. Um, so with, with, buying, with buying the glider, um, uh, I, I didn't want to cover in, in too much detail. I suppose my question here, um, sorry, sorry to drag it. So I suppose the question is, is um, you know, you, you've given a big point in terms of investment. Yeah. Um, but, you, you know, you've learned a lot, you said, about just, you know, polishing a glider and looking after the trail and things w would you say it's worthwhile investing in you know something that comes on the market because presumably they don't come up every week you know they come up few and far between and you know is it worth you know investing in one before you progress to, to your bronze or would you would you recommend that you wait um uh, and andrew i i got my first glider a k6 cr before i was bronze uh, the possibly the only disadvantage in that is that because you've not many hours of experience, the in, the insurance is going to be a bit higher. Uh, but I flew that glider uh, for nine years and went from pre bronze to gold in it. So uh, it's I must admit it's the only glider which I haven't managed to retain the capital value in it because as Tiago said it came with a crap trailer and I had to buy a new tra trailer for it. I think I think that that's the thing when when you go on the um, glider net you will see there's there's a lot of hot chips uh, for, for sale uh, there's also some labels there uh, I, I don't know that that site sometimes gets some weird stuff there including labels but actually, entry-level gliders like K6, K8, Astiers, and so on, they're very hard to find. I think since I went solo, I've seen two CS77s there for sale. Um, so 
my uh, my advice would be if it is a good glider um and you think okay actually it's a good glider good trailer it's a reasonable price even if you don't fly it away the fact that you own the glider you can learn all the different things that we talked about so the rigging the the, the polishing the five panels etc et it depends a little bit on the machine um, as i said when i when i was looking for a glider after i went solo i was looking for a k6 because realistically that's a an, an easy machine to fly you can when they come on the market they're not very expensive uh, they're relatively low maintenance um, and you know they're, they're easy to buy then there was the opportunity to buy a share in the Astia for the same price that I thought about using on, on a K6 and that that was really good and then obviously with with the events last year there was the opportunity to own it outright which at the moment for, for me financially I've got to be honest makes no sense even if even without COVID there's no way I could do the number of hours that I can, that I need to do to make it a worth, to make it a like for like investment flying club gliders. But I know that maybe by next year, actually 45 hours a year might be achievable because you, you do get better. And because you have your own glider, you've got more opportunities to, to get better. So I think it depends a little bit on, on the glider. If you do see something that you think this might be a good buy, talk with people because they will immediately say, no, this is a crap glider or you're not ready for it or Actually, this is a pretty good bargain. My general view is entry level gliders, relatively good, so that haven't been in the club environment and been trashed around left, right, and center, are hard to find. Tiago, can, can I just go back to the, the general oh, flying girls oh. test that you did for your bronze? Um, mm -hmm. In, in my experience, it was a bit more than just the check flight. And the big distinction was when you're, when you're learning to fly and going solo, you learn to deal with emergencies. Mm -hmm. But as part of the flying skills test, I, was act, I had to create the emergency. So you didn't just deal with the spin that the instructor created. I was told, right, I want you to put this glider into a spin. Um, and that's every bit as, as educational as learning to deal with it. Yeah, and I think I think Paul pitted me after the first flight, um, and he, he, you know we still we still did did some emergencies, um, but but you're right. They, they kind of want to see that you can get in and out of the situations, not just what what the hell has happened. And I know because we didn't have Veroto that day, we were just winch uh, winch launching. It was a bit more limited in terms of you know entering into a spin and trying to recover because this sort of thing. Okay, I only got a thousand feet. We, we can't joke around. Uh, so there was there was an element more of demonstration because of the way I was doing it. But again, there was always an expectation. Of, you know, uh, Paul was very good at giving me a briefing before we went. So by the time we went, even though we only had a thousand feet, it was very. Now we're going to do this, and now we're going to do this. So you have still have that opportunity to go right. This is how I go about a stall. I know one of the things I I did. <laughs> On, I think it was the second flight was Paul said okay stole the aircraft and I moved the aircraft very gingerly and said okay that's fine and I was like no you're still doing 45 knots you're nowhere near the stall you still got at least another 10 knots to go um so you know yes you're right there, there's a an entry and an exit to to the exercise rather than just oh I've I've put you in a spin solve it now it's your problem yeah that's a good point though Brilliant. Anyone else? Any other questions for Tiago? Some really, really good stuff there, Tiago. Thank you so much. Lot no of, problem. A lot of preparation work that you put into all those slides and talking <laughs> us through it. So really, really grateful for the time that you put in. Really good. And no, really helpful, but particularly for Andrew and I, who are both pre-solo. So uh, uh, pre-solo, <laughs> pre-bronze, sorry. So uh, yeah, re really, really helpful. And I'm at that stage right now in terms of you know do i get my own glider i i personally think i'm going to do another 12 months find the club gliders hopefully fly lima tango a bit more if we can and uh, get some experience in my belt before i look at buying one but uh, yeah it's a bit really whatever you do don't buy an asw19 yeah apparently they're awful <laughs> apparently they're crap <laughs> asw19 me the way to go yeah thanks tiago
No, that, that's still... okay. I'm doing the sales pitch. So, so, guys, for thank you, Tiago. Really appreciate it for everyone. Next week, you, we've got... We've got we've got... I used to earn 19 as well. <laughs> look, look what that did to your hand. I sold the 19. I sold the 19 to buy a Libel. <laughs> Ooh, that's even worse. That's going Sacri backwards. Sacrilege. Sacrilege. That is going backwards. Yes, it is, yeah. Is, is the message between the lines, Tiago, that you're looking for a syndicate partner, one that's not going to get in, in your way of cleaning the aircraft? <laughs> on, so on Monday, when I was cleaning the trailer and I bashed my head about four times and it was really hot, I got to a point I was just like, I want to sell this crap. I'm not even flying it anymore. So for me, one day it will make sense. It's just not making a lot of sense at the moment. <laughs> I've got a friend who always said, if it flies, floats up, then rent it. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, next week, next week, gents, we've got Mike Fox has offered to do a talk. Um, he's already done one, but he's offered to do one on an introduction into instructing, which I think we've got quite a few uh, budding potential instructors in, in Staffordshire, I'm sure, at the moment, who are, you know, starting to work, you know, um, have got their um, working towards the BI and then going on from BI up into ASCAT, etc. So Mike's going to give a talk, but it's next Tuesday night. Uh, he's doing it as part of the BGA series, but what he's doing is he's doing it as Staffordshire Gliding Club talk, but we're also, it's been published uh, today by Pete Stratton by the BGA, but Mike's doing it as Staffordshire Gliding Club um, member as a volunteer, not as a BGA employee. So uh, we're all uh, thankful to Mike. We're going to get a nice mention, the Staffordshire Gliding Club, but Mike's going to give a talk next Tuesday evening, and that's at eight o'clock. But what You're I'll not do is... to do a talk as a BGA employee at the moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's furloughed anyway, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Oh, is now it? we've got leverage. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But no, I thought it was good that we'll get a good mention for Staffordshire Gliding Club as well on the national scale. Um, but yes, that's next Tuesday night. I'll, I'll post on the WhatsApp group the link to register, and I'll also send the link out as well on the email for everyone, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the BGA uh, click meeting that I think quite a few of us have been on. I've been on uh, Sand uh, from Scotland giving some talks and Chris Gill gave a talk. There's been some really good talks on there as well. So um, yeah, so that's the plan for next week. And then we're looking for volunteers for any more talks. So if anyone is interested in giving a talk, I'd be really grateful. Uh, if you can let me know. Uh, we've already had a number of the senior guys give some talks. Tiago's kindly done a talk this evening. So if anyone else fancies giving a talk, that would be uh, much appreciated. Maybe Paul can give a talk about the uh, ASW 19B. <laughs> the advantages and disadvantages of owning an ASW 19. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully buys it. <laughs> All right. Well done, Tiago. Good night. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye